from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. My name is Georgia Dorn, and I'm the uh, Chief of the Hispanic Division of the Library of Congress. Thank you very much for coming to this wonderful event. The uh, lecture is going to be in English uh, in order that we reach a, a wider public, but above all, because the cybercasting for the library's website is better in English because more people can understand it. I mean, it's in publico mas amplio. Okay, so Emilio Cueto is a user of the library. He's written do a dozen books using the library's collection, the map, coll the map division, the music division, the general collections. He came to the United States with the Peter Pan program in, in the early 1960s. He has degrees in political science from Catholic University, master's from Columbia University, and a law degree from Fordham University in New York. After practicing as an attorney in New York and Paris, he worked for the Inter-American Development Bank in Washington, D.C., and Port-au-Prince, Haiti, from, from 1992 to 2006. Coito has a profound interest in Cuban culture. He's a collector of Cuban memorabilia, including books, periodicals, prints, maps, and sheet music. He has exhibited portions of his collections in Miami's Historical Museum of Southern Florida and has prepared three catalogs accompanying those exhibitions. The research leading to those books benefited immensely from the extraordinary collections of the Library of Congress, which Quaid has been regularly consulting since his college days. Quaid is also the writer and performer of a one-man play, La Cuba de Antier, which premiered in 1989, and in collaboration with El Professor Armando Tranquilino has organized six concerts of Cuban music sponsored by the Cuban Research Institute at Florida International University. The book, La Vida del Cobre de la Caridad, and El Alma del Pueblo Cubano, was presented in September 2014 by the Archbishop of Santiago de Cuba at Our Lady of Charity's Shrine in El Cobre, Cuba. It has also been presented in other venues inside Cuba, as well as Miami, New York, and the Boston and Mexico area. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a, <clears throat> indeed a privilege to be at the Library of Congress, the dream of every writer to present a book in this institution. It is also my pleasure um, and, and distinct honor to inform you that today we're making history because this is the first book in the history of Cuban-American relations that has been presented at the National Library of Cuba and the National Library of the United States. So. It is really no surprise that this is the book that has made such a feat because it's about Our Lady of Charity, the great unifier in Cuban history and Cuban culture. The story of the Our Lady of Charity is quite simple, um, although you wonder if it's so simple why the book is 560 pages. <laughs> because it's the impact that is very, very rich and complex. But the story is simple. On one day in 1612, 402 years ago, three young men were in the Bay of Nipe in the northeast part of Cuba looking for salt. And on the way to the salt mine, to the salt um, area, they saw floating in the bay something that they couldn't distinguish at first. They thought it was a doll, they thought it might be a dove. And when they approached it, it was a little statue that said, I am the Virgin of Charity. The men remarked that to their surprise, the clothing in the statue was dry, even though she was floating in the sea. And they took that as a sign of portent. And from then on, the story grew into one of the most beautiful stories in Cuban history. The the story starts in a way in 1973 because on that year a Cuban-American scholar working in the archives of the Indies in Seville discovered a, a very important document which has allowed us to, to know much more about the story. Before this date, the story of the Virgin came to us through oral history and as you well know, oral history has it's a magnificent tool for historians and for folklorists, but has the, the problem that people start enhancing 
and adding things to the story as the story is being told. So, for example, we didn't know the exact year in which this event happened. Um, at some point, it was thought that it was in the middle of a storm. Things crept, crept up in the story as it was being told. But thanks to this document that was found in 1973, we have an eyewitness testimony. One of the three men, the black little boy who was in the boat, did go before a notary in, 16, in, in 1687 and explain what happened. So we have, we have the fortune to have a, an eyewitness testimony to the story. The question I posed myself, and that was the, the, the thrust of the, of the book, is how come a statute that arrives in Cuba 100 years after the colonization of the island began, Cuba was the first city in Cuba was founded in 1511, Our Lady of the Assumption of Baracoa. How come a statute that arrived 100 years later eventually became the patron saint of Cuba, outmaneuvering everyone else? Cuba could have been, the patron could have been Our Lady of the Assumption, because in fact, that was the name of our first city, and when the King of Spain gave Cuba a coat of arms, the Our Lady of the Assumption was in that coat of arms. In 1760, Philip II named Our, La um, Our Lady of the uh, Immaculate Conception the patron of Spain and Cuba and all the colonies. So we could have had that, but we didn't. So my question was, what happened? How? Because in 100 years, the Spaniards had come with all sorts of devotions, Our Lady of Mercy, Our Lady of, of um, Guadalupe even, Our Lady of, um, of Pilar, Covadonga, Begonia, and yet this was it. So my question is, how did it happen? So I start in the book with a chronology, because the, main, the book is in Spanish, and the main audience of the book is Cubans inside the island. And for many reasons, Cubans inside Cuba know very little history and very little about religion, especially in the last 50 years in which religion has had such a clandestine type of life in Cuba. So I started in the book with a chronology which would allow the reader at the beginning to get a, a sense of what happened, and that way when they go into the book, it's a little easier to follow the book. So 1612, it's found and then we already know that in 1681, in a synod that took place in Santiago de Cuba, the, there's a, a, an approval for a cofradía, for a group of uh, believers around a particular saint to be opened in Havana. So we already have, that 70 years later, um, there's a presence in Havana. In 1699, there's a presence in Puerto Príncipe, today Camagüey. In 1724, we've, we recently found in, in old books that there was an altar to the Virgin in a church in Marianao. In 1727, in Santi Espíritus, a very important city in the center of Cuba. And in 70, 1731, we have the first knowledge that the Virgin left, you know, has transcended the island, and there was a, no, a, a novena published in Mexico, um, which has been lost, and I have a lot of friends in Mexico looking for it. In 1734, another major um, church in Camagüey. And in 1738 is very important for Cuba-US history because we already have knowledge that a, an um, American, Native American of the, of the area of St. Augustine named Juan Ignacio, sorry, um, Juan Ignacio already had a devotion to Our Lady of Charity in Florida, as long back as 1738. In 1835, people started going from all sorts, all parts of the island to El Cobre, because in addition, the, sh the Shrine of the Virgin was in a very remote place of Cuba, and Cuba didn't have much land communications for many years, so it was very hard to get to it. But people did. The devotion was such that people made an effort, such an effort that in 1835, the same way you have, if you do the Santiago, the road to Santiago in Compostela in Spain, little places would, like, like places to sleep would be open along the way so that the pilgrim could have a place. And in 1857, in, in 1835, such a, such a hostel was opened in, in Camagüey to receive midway between the, the, the eastern and western part of Cuba. 1857, 
version already goes to Puerto Rico and a novena is published in Puerto Rico. In 1861, it goes to Dominican, to what today is Dominican Republic, and there was a, a, um, an image taken to San Pedro de Macorís, and a novena also was published in Santo Domingo. And then we come to the major, a major moment in Cuban history and for the development of the cult of Our Lady of Charity in Cuba, and that was the Ten Years' War. As you will know, the Latin America became, became and began its process of independence in the early decades of the 19th century, but Cuba escaped that wave of liberation. We did not follow Ayacucho, and we remained a Spanish colony for several decades afterwards. But Cubans did not, Cubans realized at that time, the same as our um, sister republics, that we were no longer Spaniards. We were different. We were our own kind of people, and we also needed to be independent. And then in, in 1851, there were some attempts to become independent, which did not, um, did not come to fruition. And in 1868, Carlos Manuel de Cepedes, a very important Cuban lawyer, um, Gave the the, um, the fre uh, gave freedom to his slaves and declared Cuba to be independent. At that moment, Cuba began to give itself symbols to separate yourself from the other. Because if you're in war, you certainly have to know who the other is. And we have our own um, sounds of trumpets, so that the war you could have your own trumpet signs. We gave ourselves a national anthem, we gave ourselves a new flag, and we found the spiritual anchor of the Cuban nation in Our Lady of Charity. She was our spiritual anchor and our spiritual leader. She would protect us. Spaniards had Covadonga, had other uh, images of the Virgin, but she was ours. And she would be the spiritual leader behind our tribulations and wives and daughters and sweethearts would pin uh, little stamps of the Virgin and medals of the Virgin in the fighters' um, garments so that they would be protected in the war. And there were feasts in the um, um, camps of the insurgents honoring the Virgin. In 78, we have a school, which is very important because at that point, the Virgin is no longer a symbol, a religious symbol, it's now the name of a school. And in 1879, the Virgin comes to Florida. The, in the years of the war, many cigar rollers had um, established a, a, an industry which became very important in Key West and had founded a club called San Carlos and a, a permanent altar to Our Lady of Charity also graced the lives of the Cuban refugees in Key West during the war. In 1885, a very wealthy Cuban lady, Marta Abreu, opened on 8th of September, which is the festivity of the Virgin, the most important theater in Santa Clara, which is a provincial capital in the middle of the island, and it was named La Caridad. This is highly significant because, as you can see, the Virgin is leaving the altar to become part and parcel of the Cuban social fabric in this case, a theater. And in 1899, Cuba became independent. Cuba became free from Spain in 1898. We had four years of US occupation. In 1899, a Dutch-Cuban composer, Uber de Blanc, wrote an opera called Patria, appropriately called Fatherland, and it ends with a prayer to Our Lady of Charity. Then in 1916 comes the second um, most important moment in the history of how the Virgin became our patron saint, the fighters for Cuban independence requested the Pope that she be made the patron of Cuba. This is highly significant. It was not a, an initiative of the Vatican. It was not the initiative of the bishops of Cuba or of the clergy. It was a request by the lowest of the lowest, the fighters for Cuban independence, who asked the Pope, we want her who accompanied us in our struggles to be the patron of Cuba. On that occasion, every single church in Cuba began to have 
the image of the Virgin. It's the single, is the only image of a saint that appears in every human church. A church may have uh, a devotion to Our Lady of Mercy, a devotion to Saint Ildefonso, a devotion to Saint Francis, but in every Cuban church there is an image of the Virgin, usually accompanied by a um, by the coat of arms, which is embroidered in her vestment, and the Cuban flag. So the moment you go into a Cuban church today, your eyes are immediately torn away at some main, some altar, which features Our Lady of Charity. After in the 19th century of Cuba, there were only two Catholic schools, the Jesuits and the Escolapios. But then, beginning of the 1903, the Christian brothers, the Marist brothers, uh, the Pierist fathers, a lot of uh, sir, many religious orders of nuns came to Cuba. And the Catholic schools in Cuba played a significant effort in the socialization of the Virgin and in trying to instill the cult of the Virgin to a young generation who became the uh, older people, and uh, the younger then became the older that we are today. I have a classmate here um, from my high school days, and um, that's where we learned about the Virgin. This is a, um, the Marist brothers were particularly um, important in this um, transmission of the faith of, of, and of the, the devotion to the Virgin, and in the, in the school cycle, the 8th of September was an important day to remember. The uh, Escolapios, um, the Apostolado was a, an order, a Cuban order, founded by a Jesuit, Father Salinero, and they also had schools throughout the island, and they also had uh, many activities surrounding, as you can see, these are some of the, uh, some of the pictures of the, of the girls in the school around the church. And this is my own school, this is the rector, our last rector, Father Calvo, saying a mass outdoors in the church with Our Lady of Charity. In 51, 52, in, uh, Cuba became independent in 1902, and in 1952 there was a big celebration, cons you know, celebrating the f uh, cinquentenario, the 50th anniversary of Cuba's republic, and one of the events leading up to that was a pilgrimage of the Virgin throughout the island. It was a very emotional uh, event, um, and the Virgin traveled, um, a copy of the image of the Virgin, um, traveled throughout the island, it traveled to 637, 697 places, so it was amazing the, the, the effect this had, on, this had on, the, on the island, and then the actual image that appeared in 1612 and had been kept in the shrine flew to Havana in 19, 19th of May for a mass in front of the capital. The Virgin was taken to the highest point of Cuba, El Pico Turquino, where the only other uh, statue existing was that of Jose Martí, the highest, the, the best known of Cuban intellectuals and patriots. The Virgin came up in a postal stamp in 57, so again it traveled throughout the island in, in envelopes. It, she was the object of commercial propaganda. We have the Cardinal of Cuba blessing a soap, uh, Jabón Palmolive, um, so if you bought some soap you would also um, have the opportunity to pray to the Virgin. Um, not to be less, Jabón Crucellas also decided to put her on the cover. Bacardi had a nice little um, say, thing that said, you go to Oriente to, have, uh, to pray to the Virgin and then also to have a little rum Bacardi. <laughs> and the fan, the fan in the lower corner is from a product called, um, that used to be sold in Cuba, called Tricofero de Barri, which had this, such, such a wonderful sounding name, apparently you would have all this great hair. And uh, they also took advantage of, uh, of the Virgin to, to give a little fan to the public. This is a magnificent propaganda by um, a forgotten Cuban artist, Adolfo Galindo. And this is uh, for Bayern, um, um, some, um, uh, some sort of pain reliever. And there you have the Virgin in the center in, in war and in peace, presiding over the major um, the, the Cubans and the three ma most important Cubans, Maximo Gomez, Martí, and Maceo. An incredible uh, piece of um, memorabilia. Uh, the Mueblería Dos Hermanos um, also wanted to, um, to um, sell, um, you know, to, to greet its, its clients with a little almanac. The Omnibus La Cubana, who would travel from Santiago to Havana, would give that to the customers. I don't know whether the customers would pray that the 
bus would arrive on time. <laughs> and even recently in Cuba, um, which is hard to find because for many years, as I'll explain, Cuba was a lapse from public life, the Cuban telephone company had a prepaid card with Our Lady of Charity. Also politics, uh, people uh, who wanted to go into office, in this case Francisco Rivero, thought that instead of his picture he could put the Virgin and maybe get a little more votes. <laughs> and, and Rafael Cusa, at least he put his little picture there, so at least you would know who you were electing. The Virgin had also an incredible public space presence in the covers of the two most important weeklies of Cuba, Bohemia and Carteles. Every 8th of September, which was the Feast of the Virgin, the entire, um, all the corners of Cuba that were, that were, where you would sell newspapers would be papered with the image of the Virgin. They were usually very beautiful and many people who had no, not the means to go to the religious stores to buy an image of the Virgin would simply clip the cover of the magazine and that would be found in many, many poor homes in Cuba. Uh, this is a selection of some of the covers that you can see from Ellas, a ladies magazine, to Carteles, where one of the most important illustrators of Cuba, Andres Garcia Benitez, reigned um, on challenge for 20 years. In 1959, another major event in this, gr in this growth of the cult of the Virgin, there was a mass, Cuba, the Cuban bishops called for a big mass at the main square of Cuba, then called Plaza Civica, today called Revolutionary Square, and a big mass, big mass with attendance. Some people in the, in the audience, like me, were there on that day, and the Virgin, the, the, the statue flew again from Havana. Castro was in attendance. But the honeymoon with the church would soon to end. By 1969, many, many things had happened. The uh, Castro regime was turning more socialist. The, and and f for purposes of our talk, the Virgin, which had conquered public spaces through 350 years, lost all of them. The schools were confiscated in June of 61, and there were no longer images of the Virgin in schools. I don't know if you've seen recently a magnificent Cuban movie called Conducta, which I recommended for you to see. It's an incredible movie. Came out, came out last year in Cuba. Got many prizes, and the main, the main, um, um, the troublesome spot in the movie is when a young girl, um, moved by the death of a classmate, attempts to put a little image of the Virgin in the mural of the school, and the whole system collapses because that cannot simply be done. Um, the Virgin, the confiscation of the press led to the end of the appearance of the Virgin in the cover of the magazines. The processions outside of the churches were all forbidden, um, and people were even afraid of carrying the little medal of the Virgin uh, around their necks. So for 30 years, you had a huge space, uh, um, an open space, an empty space, in which the Virgin was nowhere to be found. In exile, however, we who came decided that, that we would not do that to Our Lady, and we kept uh, remembering her and honoring her in many ways. In Miami in 1973, this big shrine opened, La Ermita de la Caridad, a very beautiful space honoring the Virgin. Even in, in here in Washington, um, through some of the people, some of them who are here today, an effort was made so that the a big marble statue would be placed at the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception near the campus of Catholic University. And then in Miami, the, there's a, a, a journal called Ideal began to be published, which again, as in Cuba, they would offer, they would often offer in the cover of the magazine, Images of the Virgin. Now the silence of Cuba ended about, it lasted about 30 years. And it's an honor, um, it's, it's an honor of the editors of the magazine Del Caribe, which is published by a, by a very prestigious institution in Santiago de Cuba called Casa del Caribe, which at some point said we cannot longer hide the importance of the Virgin in the history of Cuba. And they had a, a special number, which I'm sure it's in the Library of Congress, in which they had a 52-page dossier on, on the importance of El Cobre in Cuban culture. And again, 
for the first time in a official Cuban publication, you could have some, some meaningful discussion about the importance of the Virgin. And then two years later, the historian of Santiago, Olga Portuondo, wrote a seminal book, Our Lady of Charity, and she chose as a subtitle, which is the most important part of the book, symbol of Cubanity. So she could have just said Our Lady of Charity and talk about it in a, in a very um, neutral way, but she acknowledged what we all know, that she is no longer, she is no, no, no longer, she's not another devotion in Cuba. She is so close to Cuba that she represents the nation. In 1998, the Pope went to Cuba, and for the first time, um, the images of the Virgin would be shown in television in 40 years, and every, at every step, he could have the opportunity he would talk about the Virgin. And in 2010, in anticipation of the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the Virgin, the Church convoked a second national procession, and once again, the Virgin traveled throughout the island. Very moving experience, which the Virgin touched the hearts of all Cubans throughout the country. Um, and in 2012, the new Pope, Pope Benedict XVI, went to Cuba. And to the surprise of everybody, in the main revolutionary square facing Che Guevara and Camilo Cienfuegos, the, the 14th um, story high library of Cuba, had a image of Our Lady of Charity. So you can see how a little image that appeared unannounced on a Nipe Bay in 1612, ended up presiding the most important public square of Cuba. Um, it goes on, and then the rest of the book tries to um, document the incredible importance of this devotion in, Cuban, um, uh, in, in the creation of Cuban artists. When the book was introduced by the Archbishop of Santiago in El Cobre, he said that this is actually the book of the Cuban people to the Virgin, and all I did was to document it, and he is correct. So the rest of the book is how the Virgin showed up in visual arts, in music, in literature, in radio, TV and movie, and in dance. And she shows up everywhere. Uh, this is a little um, image. Actually, this is very interesting. This is what happened. Historically, the three men were in the boat, and saw the little statue, actually even smaller than that. And one of the interesting things about the iconography of the Virgin is that Cubans refuse to see it like that. How can you pray to someone who's about to drown? I mean, if she cannot save herself, I'm not going to pray to her. So we decided that we were going to see it in a different light. So the images of the Virgin are really very different. Either she's alone, or she is on top of the um, three men, um, and, and then you're ready to pray for her, because she's so big and so uh, she's really helping. So here we have, and then I divide the images of the Virgin, In this is very technical, so I, I try in the book to divide the image of the Virgin in three families, one in which is um, alone with the moon looking down. This is the first um, depiction of the Virgin. This is, I'll, I'll stop here for a moment because this is the first printed image of the Virgin in Cuba. Unfortunately, there are no, no um, copies of this image in Cuba. No, no books have been found. And this image is from the Library of Congress. So it's thanks to the Library of Congress that this image showed up in the book. Another, another set of images is when the Virgin shows up with six medallions telling the story of how she was found. These are two French images. And then this is it. This is how we like to see her. Huge on top of the three um, men. This didn't happen. And yet this is the way <laughs> That, that we have managed to present it to us and to the world. This is the most popular and it's what shows up. If you go to the shrine and look for an image of the Virgin, that's the version you'll find. And then the, the book goes up to show 300 years of Cuban imagery of the Virgin. Some are very stunning and very different. Um, actually, one gentleman asked me in one of my conferences whether I thought that this huge depiction, the, the huge, um, the, the range of depictions of the Virgin was also the case in other, in other manifestations of the Virgin. And actually, I couldn't respond. I hadn't thought of the question. But now that I think of it, 
um, I think that it reflects more the Cuban character. Uh, if you look at the Virgin de Guadalupe, I think it, she, Mexicans don't take many liberties with that image. They're always the same. And if you look at Virgen de Covadonga, and if you look at Luján, they always look the same. Yet in Cuba, we don't mind, uh, as you'll see some of them, we don't mind playing with her. She's so familiar. We feel that she's part of the family, and then that we can, we can, we can, we can really dialogue with her. Uh, you can see her playing domino in the in the right hand side. Um, this one is a Mona Lisa. So I, I I don't think you'll see a Guadalupe as a Mona Lisa. So I think that's a so a subject to ponder for some PhD candidate somewhere. Um, you have the the one at the bottom, the gentleman that is doing it horizontally. He is a Mexican in his town in Mexico that he uses colored sand and does uh, transient images of, of the Virgin. So this is temporary, co temporary art, contemporary and temporary art. You have um, the one on the left uh, is Father Loredo, a priest who suffered 10 years of prison in Cuba, and he has a great devotion to Our Lady of Charity. The one on the right is the great René Portocarrero. The one on top is um, one of the great Cuban artists, Jose Maria Mijares. The one at the bottom is a famous contemporary artist, Jose Bedia. Cundo Bermudez, another of the great Cuban artists of our times. On the left is Michael Herrera, a young Cuban artist from Cuba. Um, also in statues, this is a statue by an Italian um, sculpture, which is in the Cuba's uh, cemetery in Havana. And then these are other statues. Um, the one, the color one on the bottom, I'll, I'll call your attention, it's a Barbie uh, that a Cuban artist from Puerto Rico decided to, uh, to dress and, sh and she is at the Smithsonian. So the greatest museum in the world has a Cuban Catholic charity Barbie. <laughs> the, in, she is, uh, the Virgin is also presented in ceramic objects, the Casa Yadro, a very famous Spanish porcelain house had this magnificent piece. The one on the top is by a Cuban friend of ours, Emilio Falero, a, a well-known artist. Um, the one on the right-hand side is by René Portocarrero. It's a beautiful mural in a, a church in Havana. She's also in stained glass. The um, original stained glass in the black and white picture um, was ex exploded when during our civil war against Batista. So they had to be replaced with the top ones in color. And the one, the one in the right with the flag is in Vero Beach, Florida. Miami is a big one. And the little one on the left in color is at the, in the tomb of Celia Cruz. This is a display of a few images. Uh, I'll call your attention to the second from the left. Uh, it's in Barcelona. It's in Tibidabo, the beautiful uh, temple on top of the mountain in Barcelona. She is in caricature. You have um, the, um, the image of this Cuban folkloric character who has a huge medal of the Virgin uh, to show everybody that he not only is devoted to the Virgin, but he has money to afford it. Um, the Virgin appeared in certain comics. Um, some comics were made um, throughout to the series throughout Latin America. In textiles, you have on the left side, it's uh, some, some mitres of bishops, and um, you have Bishop Roman there, who's a, a bishop of uh, Miami, who was uh, the head of the shrine in Miami for years. She also appeared in tattoos. So clearly, when you're in prison, you need protection, and the Virgin uh, is also uh, um, present there. And then the, I think the, the, the most important part of the book, as far as scientific background is concerned, is the, the entries following each of the chapters. There's a, a thousand entries on visual arts. So a lot of people have painted the Virgin in Cuba. So what I've done for the researchers is to have a list, a very detailed list, a very rather complete, although of course a lot of people have escaped me, I'm showing that. And that's what I've done in every chapter. And I'm, I, I want to move along. Then we have literature. And again, some books of literature. I point the attention to that Nobel Prize medal. Um, Ernst Hemingway won his Nobel Prize for a novel, Old Man on the Sea. 
that was based in Cuba, and he mentions in the book Our Lady of Charity. He was so humbled by the price that he thought that the price should be given to the people of Cuba, who had in fact given him the honor of the price, and he thought that the best place, the most important symbol of Cuba that he could think of to give the medal to was the shrine of El Cobre. So the, the Virgin received a Nobel Prize medal. And this is me on the left in, one of, in, in a one-man show that I had some years ago. So um, I don't think any, a Mexican would dress as well a Lupe that often. Uh, and then we have some poems and then music. We have many examples of, of DVDs and, and again, an inventory of, um, of musicians, the 200 musicians. And then radio, TV, and movie. Cuba was, uh, had the dubious distinction of being the inventor of the telenovela and the radionovela. And it started with uh, El Derecho de Nacer, which was a major event in Cuban history. And Mama Dolores, um, who was the maid who saves a little kid, um, she was a great um, fan of Our Lady of Charity. This is a cover of a, of a magazine for uh, radio in Cuba, 38. And then there was a movie called Our Lady of Charity, very important movie for Cuban history of cinema. And this is the Mexican um, um, poster for the movie that was made in Mexico. So of all, the, of all the things that happened in the movie, the artist chose the rel relationship between Mama Dolores and the Virgin. No other, um, other movies of Cuba. Uh, the one on the bottom with a, with a car, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun movie called Juan de los Muertos, where Cuba is peopled by zombies, and these people are trying to escape. And of course, the way to escape the zombies is to put the Virgin in front, <laughs> as if she would lead the way. And in an iconic movie of exile called El Super, uh, the, 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 um, the, the protagonist is just reminiscing with the wife of things in Cuba, and notice that in the kitchen in exile, they have a little almanac with the image of the Virgin. Um, although the Catholic Virgin doesn't dance, the Afro-Cuban version of it, it does. It's Ochun from Africa, a very important deity, which came with the slaves, and the, in Cuba it was associated with Our Lady of Charity. It starts as a popular dance. You have that picture from Bohemia in 1950, and it soon gets elevated by the Cuban talent, talented dancers and choreographers into the main stream of Cuban dance. And there's a theater, there's a, there's a, a, a dance, a ballet called Epure Se Mueve. And then I, I talk a little bit about the moon of Our Lady of Charity. If you look at it, it faces down, which is unusual. It's not unique, but it's unusual. Most of the virgins that appear on a moon, and the, the reason of the moon is a verse from Apocalypse. Um, but if you notice, most Cuban, most virgins of charity have the, the, the face, fa the moon's edges are turning down, and I go a little bit into that. Um, although I, I, pay, I call the attention to the fact that the moon has, in, 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 in the development of the moon, it has developed into such an odd shape that it looks like, like um, horns. And finally, the last chapter, which is very dear to me, is the presence of the Virgin throughout the world. The Virgin traveled alone only once, when she was found floating in the sea. Since then, Cubans of all persuasions and races and, and ages and, and the social class have taken with us. She, you're not too far from your homeland when you're near the Virgin. So we've taken it all over. And the Virgin, the, there's a little map that shows you the presence is about 250 cities in the world where she is either in an altar or she ha there's a there's a um, an enterprise it could be a cooperative of doctors it could be a bakery it could be a restaurant that is named after our lady of charity uh, this is argentina this is a a, convoc a meeting of exiles in toronto and they go to this restaurant this is in colombia in Ecuador, Bridgeport, Connecticut. This is the one here in Washington, D.C., in the shrine by great sculptor Manuel Rodolfo Tardo, Gainesville, the shrine in Miami. The cemetery of Miami has these life-size images of the Virgin. Hawaii, in a restaurant in Hawaii called Soul of Cuba, the walls are, are um, 
graced by oil paintings of the Virgin, the New Jersey procession, which is a huge procession every year around the, um, the city. This is me years ago in a botanica in New Jersey. As you can see, the devotion can take huge proportions. Uh, the Peter Pan operation, um, when the, my, my young compatriots went to New Mexico, the albergue there was called Virgen, uh, Villa Virgen del Cobre. New York, long story, make it very short, in 1920, it showed up there and um, in one of the ceremonies it was attended by the governor of the state of New York, the mayor of the state of New York, and a choir of 60 policemen from the state of New York. All of that for this little refugee image of the Virgin, New York. The, uh, we have a Cuban-American bishop, Monsignor Cisneros, and in his Kreuzer he has the Virgin of Charity smiling at him in Washington. San Pedro Sula in Honduras, you have these little three, three kids reenacting the arrival of the Virgin. Mexico, the Cathedral of Mexico has a beautiful image. Panama, Puerto Rico, Venezuela, and Seville, a Cuban uh, had made a solid silver image of the Virgin for the Paso de Palio of uh, one of the uh, Holy Week processions. Barcelona, um, the, the aunt of a friend of mine who's here sitting with us, had it made in her living room when she arrived in Barcelona. In Melilla, the, the Virgin, an, an altar to the Virgin arrived in Africa in 1920. In Lisieux in France, Mexico, in Italy, in Italy, the whole city celebrated the 400th anniversary of the Virgin. The, the Cubans in Miami sent this image to Nazareth. And in India, um, a 2,500 capacity church was built in 1957. There's a virgin that went there with six ribbons, each containing earth from one of the six provinces of Cuba. Philippines, and in Beijing, this is a, face, a Facebook page from a Cuban who was sent to study in China, and his mother had given him a 1950s calendar from the um, pain reliever Mejoral, so that so that the, um, the Virgin would keep him safe in Beijing. And then the Virgin had a trip throughout the island in 19, 2010, and that is the picture of the, of the tour of the Virgin, so that it's remembered, and images of where the Virgin is in Cuba and throughout the island. So that's, uh, I'll just stop in one image, which is fascinating. As I was walking in Cuba one day, I met this pilgrim with this um, papier mache image, he was walking all the way from Havana to Santiago, and in the way he was asking for prayers and contributions, he would take to the Virgin. And that's in Camagüey, and that's everywhere. And then at the end, something useful for researchers, I have an index of names, so that a book like this, which has thousands of names, you could not get lost and you could find what you want. So if you want to know whether Favelo great Cuban artist painted the Virgin, you could find him immediately. And if you want to know whether, uh, you know, um, a, a poet of Cuba, Miguel Barnet, might have mentioned it in a poem, you could find him. So that's a tool for researchers, which um, as a researcher myself, I welcome those tools very much. And the Virgin says goodbye with this little image, which is a, it's perforated um, so that a, a person in his home could put a light on the, behind it and simulate a lit altar for, uh, for a prayer at night. Thank you very much. I don't know if you have any questions. Or, yes, please. Well, I have a comment and a question. Thank you so much for that. That was really beautiful. Um, and uh, just wanted to let you know that some of the exchange between Cuba and the library happened about, what, two years ago when we hosted um, Zuleika Romé from the Institute of the Book. Yes. So, you know, we're all excited to go to Cuba now and see her. Wonderful. Um, I'm an FIU grad. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, my middle name is Maria. So. Well. <laughs> but my question is, when did the image of the Virgin come to Miami? Was it prior to the um, exiles coming, or did, did the Well, there, to my knowledge, 
I'm, I'm sure there were some private images in Miami before because many Cubans have lived in Miami, um, although Miami was not as, as popular as New York before 59. But the, the image came actually on 8th of September of 61. The image, mm, the image now in Miami at the shrine was the image of the parish of Guanabo, where Father Jimenez Rebollar, who eventually came to live in Washington, D.C., was the pastor. He flew it out of Cuba. In fact, it was so difficult to transport these things that he had to use the um, services of the Panamanian ambassador in Cuba, and she took it out of Cuba in the diplomatic valise, took it to Mexico, I believe, or to Panama, and arrived just in time for the 8th of September Mass that was being held in Miami. So you have all these thousands of people waiting for the 8th of September Mass in Miami in 1861. And from the airport, um, they, fl they took, they rushed the image so it arrived on time for the Mass. And that is the image that is today at the shrine in Miami. So at least since 61, um, it's in, in public view in Miami. I'm sorry? Can I hope that book is for sale because I want to buy one? It is. It is. Okay. okay. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for your beautiful presentation. It was very enlightening, and I love the slides. Um, I work in a division that uh, is acquiring and cataloging materials from Cuba, and because of the embargo, the U.S. embargo, we've been purchasing via a vendor uh, that lives in Uruguay. Yes. Um, and so I'm so glad you brought out the image uh, uh, that we have here in the collections. And I wanted to thank uh, the Hispanic Division and Georgette Dorn and her staff for having gotten that out of the Library of Congress collections. My question has to do, though, with where is the location in India that the ver you have? It's a city called Katak. C U T T A. Oh, okay. C -K. I wasn't sure. Right. I didn't catch that. The bishop was a Spaniard. Mm -hmm. Um, as, as life had it, and he had apparently learned of Our Lady of Charity, and he wanted to bring the devotion to India. And what part of India is that? We have an office in New Delhi. I just wondered, is that northern? Or I think it's Indian? not. I think it's. I really don't I remember. Look. I looked it up at one point, and I, I don't. I don't like to mislead anyone, so I rather southern. play it safe. Have a lot of there. Yes. Like yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. But it's fascinating to know that two thousand five hundred. Well, of course, in India, everything is massive, but, you know, like in Texas, well, I thank suppose. You thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes? Would the uh, workers who came to work in the cigar factories in Tampa not brought the Virgin earlier? Well, they may have brought it earlier in a, in a private devotion, but an altar was built in 1871. Actually, they had arrived not long before. It was the, the, the reason f the... The United States had high duties on Cuban tobacco. So someone had the bright idea, well, maybe if we bring the leaf and roll the tobacco here, you pay a smaller duty. So that's how the factories began to grow in Key West. And it was around 1868. So it was about a decade into the, the community that they had. And of course, you know, you're rolling tobacco. You're not, you're, you know, you're not having you know, high wages. So I, I, it must have taken about a decade to have an altar built for the Virgin. But I'm sure that she was being honored in private homes. Yes? Aside of the opera, what was the presence of um, the mention of the Virgin in music? Oh, well, the Virgin is um, present in many, many songs. Maria Teresa Vera, very popular. Even Compay Segundo has a very beautiful song called El Balcón de Santiago mentioning the Virgin, Eliseo Grenet has a magnificent, Lecuona has a, a great song to the Virgin, and of course the most important one is called Veneración by Matamoros, one of the most popular Santiago uh, composers, and has this little um, uh, estribillo that, uh, that everybody knows, and says, si vas al cobre, quiero que me traiga una virgencita de la caridad, yo no quiero flores, Yo no quiero estampa, lo que quiero es virgen de la caridad. So you see, it's a... <laughs> um, 
she is well known. <laughs> Any other um, comment? Yes. Uh, the original image that the three guys found. Right. Is that in? That's the one in the shrine. In some, yeah. She was taken from from the from the sea to the coast. Today there is a little um, there's a cross marking the moment, the place where she was landed. Then she was taken to another little little hut called Barahawa, where she stayed for a little while. There's a church there commemorating that presence. And eventually she was transferred to the copper mines, which was the most important economic center of the zone at the time. Yes? So did the, the three guys take the image to the parish priest? They, they yeah, they took it, well, they were not, yeah, they took it to the city and then the priest, the a priest there, there was no parish there in Barahawa, but they took it, no, they kept it, they knew it was something sacred, they, they realized they were in the presence of something unique. It was not just something, there was not a game, it was not a play, it was not a doll, it was something important. And eventually the church, you know, it was a big procession from Barahawa to, uh, I think the Franciscan priests led the way. Yes? Well, the, the, there are, of course, many statues of the Virgin. There was one in the Church of St. Thomas in Santiago de Cuba, which is called La Virgen Mambisa. Uh, Mambi is a Cuban word for insurgent against Spain. And because she was associated with the War of Independence against Spaniards, she got the name Virgen Mambisa. So, and that, there's a particular image in St. Thomas Church in Santiago, which is the one they have used for travel. Um, for the daily travel. The Virgin did travel twice to Havana, one in 59, 52 and once in 59. So she's like a rebel or a confederate. Right. Yes. How did the composer who wrote the opera, La Patria? La pa Patria, Patria. How did he find out about La Virgen? Well, he he was a um, he was born in Utrecht in Holland, and was living in New York when he met a Cuban cherche la femme. He made a Cuban um, refugee here, and you know as it happens, he fell in love, and then I'm sure that through through the wife he learned about the Virgin, went to Cuba, um, and then he, he thought that this would be um, an important contribution uh, in part of his opera. Yes. One last question. Uh, the statue must have fallen from a Spanish boat into the sea. Well, um, likely, right? A boat that's coming from Spain. So is the original statue preserved, the one that they found? In the yes. Well, the, 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 there are many theories as to how did this happen. And there are mainly two basic theories. One, it fell from, it's, it's clearly a Spanish, although I will say one thing after in a moment. It's, it, it certainly looks like a Spanish statue and the likelihood that it fell from some sort of a ship, it's very likely. On the other hand, scholarship has shown that part of the culture of seafaring, of, of seafaring people and people who live on the coast is that when a hurricane or a bad, bad you know, weather occurs, people throw their statutes and their saints to the sea in the hope of having a, more, a, a calmer um, result. So the Virgin could have either fallen from or thrown, because you remember the Spaniards had been in Cuba for a hundred years, and they must have brought many virgins. So this could have been already in Cuba inside some um, Aboriginal hut. And then when some hurricane passed, they threw it, and that's how it ended up. But about the origin, it's, it's, it has been a little complicated the Virgin has been restored in a few occasions, and in the last time it was restored, it was in the 80s. The, um, there was, there's an interview to the bishop um, who explains, and it's very good because, you know, for scholars, these are the things that make a lot of sense. And apparently when they examine the composition of the Virgin, the Virgin is what's called imagen de bulto, which is it's not a solid statue. It has head hands and the rest is um, you know like um, how do you call that like yeah it's 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 not a solid such but they discovered that it was that it had corn paste and corn paste of course sends you to this new world
because the corn is originally from Mexico. So um, now I'm not going, that doesn't mean that it originally came with that, which some scholars have concluded. Since you've had, by the time of 82, 1982 came, there have been eight or nine restorations, the corn could have, added, could have been added at some point. But nevertheless, it raises the intriguing question that how did the corn paste uh, get there? So it's a good question. I, we don't know how it, how it so there's a, le, there's a level of mystery. Yes, please. You did a good job in posing as the lady. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, actually, people, people did laugh and people did contribute money for the cause, so it was all in good, in good, in good gesture. <laughs> Yes. Why is she um, considered Oshun rather than Yemaya? Well, it's a good question. Um, Yemaya is is associated with another um, of our deities, Our Lady of Regla. So I I don't know why the choice was made, but um, but made it was, and I don't I, I'm not sure what went on because both course are related to water. Um, one thing I should mention in the Afro-Cuban syncre syncretization, but it's, it's much more complicated than I think I have read. The, when, we saw, when we say Africa, it's a, it's a grave mistake uh, in the sense that Africa is a continent. Um, the same was Spain in the 15th, 16th century. It was a mosaic of places. So we tend to shorthand with the name Africa what was many, many cultures and many places. And not every part of Africa had the Yoruba religion. In fact, the virgin was found by a black slave, the little kid who had, was 10 years old and who um, we were fortunate enough to have his testimony when he was 75, um, who then speaks of what he saw. But those slaves were from Angola and Congo. And they did not think of Ochung. Ochung is a really, it's a, it's a, it's a phenomenon of, of 1830s, 1840s in Cuba. And Ochung is born not in Santiago near the shrine, it's born out of the barracoons in Matanzas and Havana. So it's a, it's a, the virgin, the Catholic virgin comes from Oriente to the West and Ochung comes from the West to Oriente. In fact, Oriente people, um, there was a, um, there's a historian of Oriente, <clears throat> Julio Corbea, who did a study some years ago, and he found that the syncretism in Oriente is smaller than in other parts of the country. Um, so it, it's not, Afri it, when we say African-Cuban, it, it's really a section of Africa that, that made the connection. Yes? Isn't Yemanya associated with Santa Barbara? No, Santa Barbara is Chango. Which is, um, um, and I, th I, you know, I think it's the fact that it's really an interesting synch syncretization. Chango is a warrior, mm -hmm. and Santa Barbara is a victim. So, but but Santa Barbara has a sword, a sword because she was cut with it. So, but people saw someone with a sword, and they said, "Aha, she must be the warrior." I'm, I'm just making it up. I don't know. <laughs> But to me, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a scholar of, I'm not a scholar of syncretism. But it makes sense. I mean, if you come from abroad with your, with your imaginary and with your traditions and with your religion and 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 you you're looking for someone who's fierce and has a I mean, usually saints don't look fierce. So um, so you know, and you see someone with a sword, you know, it makes sense that if you're going to assign a role, you say, okay, this is it. But then it maybe should have been Ogun because he's the one of iron. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But anyway, Chango is um, Our Lady of uh, uh, Santa Barbara. Yes. While um, I haven't seen any examples of Mexicans tampering with the image of the Virgen Guadalupe, Mexican Americans do. Ah, how fascinating! That's very interesting. In fact, I think that the library contains an image uh, done by Esther Hernandez. Uh, who is an artist in California, uh -huh. uh, in which she comes up with her own version. Well, that's fascinating. Thank you. I, I, they also use the version of Guadalupe on tattoos. Okay. Yes, that, that they do. That they do, I know. That I know, but I mean, we Cubans, I mean, 
we have a familiarity with the Virgin. At, at some point in the 1920s, the paintings on the Virgin ceased to be objects of cult to become, to become objects of art. That transition, I, put, I suggest Carlos Enriquez as a possible uh, pioneer in this thing, but clearly most of the images of today of Our Lady of Charity in Cuba are not born out of a religious imagery of, of praying. You're not inclined to pray to the Virgin that it's depicted as a Mona Lisa. I think it's more a reflection on how she's so part of Cuba, like the palm tree or you know the, the national bird, that you can usually use it for your own um, composition. But thank you, that's very useful information. I will tell the friend who asked me. Any? I think one more question? We'll have one more. I have no doubt. I have no doubt that 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 proximity, the fact that she's one of us, you know, I think that 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 makes us very close to her. Yeah, yeah, it's part of the family. Thank you very much. It was an excellent lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Share the book. You can buy it. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a great Thank pleasure you. and a great honor. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.